Okay. Okay. So we've uh, the class recording is on. Good morning, everyone, to BC one one one, our course on faith. Thank you for being in the class today. Let's pray and let's get started together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together like this here in person and online and uh, even our e-learning students. We thank you for each one, even as we uh, take time to be in your word, uh, to hear, to listen, to understand. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead us, that the Holy Spirit will write upon the table of our hearts, will write the truth of your word into our hearts so that together, Lord, we will be able to do your word, practice your word, and see amazing results in our journey of faith as individuals and as a collective body. Uh, teach us, train us, equip us by your spirit and by your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class we kind of uh, paused when I said you need to ask. I think some of you wanted to ask some questions. I hope you remember your questions. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, but I'm going to quickly uh, review uh, the lesson we were covering and then we will open up for your questions uh, and then we will proceed from there. So I'm going to share the PDF just to quickly review. We've been Talking about one minute. Um, PDF. Yes. Okay. So we've been talking about collective faith. And uh, just quickly review some of the things we shared. Um, we talked about the importance of being in agreement. Uh, this is based on what Jesus said in Matthew 18, that he said, if we agree on earth uh, and ask anything, it will be done. So Jesus himself taught us the importance of being in agreement. And uh, then we talk, looked at examples of uh, collective faith in action. Uh, we looked at the early church in Acts chapter 4, uh, how they prayed together in Acts 4, and then we saw the outcome of what happened. Uh, the miracles that took place on the streets through Peter's shadow and so on. Uh, we talked, we saw how Peter was released from prison as the disciples were praying. Uh, we also saw Acts 14, uh, the example or the incident when Paul was stoned and uh, the disciples gathered around him and prayed. And immediately, miraculously, he was healed and he woke up and and he got up and he went back into the city and he continued on his journey preaching. Um, we talked about how our collective faith puts up a solid front, meaning a defense, a protection, a wall, uh, when we stand in order and have faith together. And uh, we saw that as a community, we can keep increasing in faith and uh, keep growing in faith. And so this is a journey that we make together as a community. We also mentioned a few things about things that will destroy collective faith, murmuring, complaining, being in competition, strife, uh, or self, or pride, or jealousy. These things destroy collective faith. That means when we come together to have faith, if people are in jealousy, strife, and all those things, it disturbs the faith that we want to see exercised. And so in, in view of that, uh, we must learn how to minister as a team. And most of the time, we, are, we will be ministering as teams. Right? Uh, it's not that we are ministering alone. Uh, you know, We have others with us who are also believers, who love the Lord, and you know, we minister as a team. So we need to learn to flow together, not in competition. You're not trying to outdo each other, but flow together. You know, Be sensitive uh, to... Uh, working together as a team. So uh, we need to nurture and protect uh, genuine team ministry. So we uh, went on to that. We also, you know, talked about a little bit, we had quite a bit of discussion on um, will the unbelief of one person affect the collective faith of the group? Yeah, that was a lot of questions uh, we, we were discussing on that. So I shared my thoughts and 
what we see in scripture. And uh, this was the last part which we didn't cover. I'll just cover it and then we will take up questions on the same topic on collective faith. So what happens when we face failure in collective faith? Right? And this has happened. You know, there are times when, you know, uh, on, on, on a couple of occasions, we call the church together to pray for something. Uh, I mean, when I say church, not everybody came, but sometimes 20 people, 30 people would gather together to pray for one particular thing. And uh, there have been times when we failed, like we didn't see the outcome. Okay. So, especially, example, we're praying for a child who became sick and died for the child to come back to life. So, there, you know, once one whole night we all gathered in the house, one house, we prayed whole night, I think. There must have been at least 30 people, 40 people through the night praying. But nothing happened. Next day, we did the funeral. But then a lot of people were, you know, very, very, you know, what is the right word to use? Maybe discouraged, maybe questioning. What happened? You know, why didn't God, he, you know, resurrect the child? And so we have to, uh, as a leader, as a pastor, you have to provide an explanation or you have to address this. You, you can't pretend that that never happened. So, you know, uh, how, how would you handle it? How would you do that? What would you say? Right? So some of the things, one is uh, be dead to self-reputation. So it's not about my name. It's not about the name of APC. You know, it's look, we as a community are journeying into this. There are times we see amazing results, and there are times we may see failures. Okay, in success and in failure, we are together. We succeed together, we fail together. When we succeed together, let's learn. You know, what did we do right? When we fail, let's learn. Where did we fail? What went through? You know, we have to seek God. So don't... So. You know, it's not about an individual's reputation, right? Secondly, don't defend God. We don't have to defend God. God, God is our defender. We are not His defender, right? So it's like, so don't feel the pressure to try to defend God. So God, you're big enough to defend yourself. I'm only uh, uh, under shepherd. I'm only trying to lead the people the best I know how. I don't have all the answers. I'm also learning, journeying with God. But God knows everything. Right? So we don't put the pressure on yourself to try to defend God. You know, God, please handle this. You know, you, you move on the hearts of people. You take care of them. Okay? Thirdly, don't give explanations by trying to fault others. This is a very bad thing to do. You know, don't say, ah, those three people, they didn't pray. Properly, <laughs> you know, if you have a group of 30, 40 people, don't pick on a couple of people, you know, don't say they didn't pray properly, they didn't do it right, you know, don't fault people, especially when we don't know ourselves for sure. We don't know, right? But the thing is, when we start faulting people, like, oh, they were like this, or they were like this, then they get hurt, you know, they get hurt. So don't fault people. Don't try to put the blame on others. Just you know. number four is encourage others and then say, hey, look, we prayed. We know we didn't see the result. That doesn't mean God is bad. That doesn't mean his word has changed. God is still the same. His word is still the same. You and I are growing. You and I are learning how to exercise faith. It's like, you know, we gave the example of learning to ride a bike or uh, drive a car. You may have some accidents. That doesn't mean you can never learn to ride a bike. Right? What do you do? You get up and start riding again. So we say, okay, let's go on. Let's see how we can move in this. Okay? And so number five is don't quit. We don't give up. So we tell the people, let's continue. Let's keep moving forward. Even the disciples failed, but Jesus didn't disqualify them. 
or oh, nine of you, you could not cast the devil out. So from today onwards, you are no longer my disciples. <laughs> he didn't say that. Yeah, they failed. But what did they do? They came and asked Jesus, why couldn't we do it? And then he taught them. He said, because of your unbelief. If you have faith, you will tell the mountain to move, it will move. So even when they experienced failure, Jesus didn't disqualify them. He taught them. He said, look, you can learn something. You know. So uh, we have to be like that. We have to learn. Okay. Uh, it's nothing wrong with God, nothing wrong with the will of God, nothing wrong with the word of God, nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit, nothing wrong with our calling. He said we have to learn about faith, about how to exercise faith, just like how Jesus taught his disciples. You know, this is what you do. So let's pause here before we go forward and uh, take up any questions. Uh, any questions from the online class? Any questions from. Uh, those of you here, to on this whole subject of collective faith. I know we had a lot of discussion last week, but um, let's open up. Do you remember your questions? Okay. Go ahead. You have the mic with you. What was the question? If you remember your question from last week, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Pastor can Satan give temptation according to the level of faith? Um, can Satan give temptation or uh, tempt us according to our level of faith, faith. Um, okay so there is no chapter in verse on this the only verse that i can think of is first peter 5 8 and 9 uh, where the bible tells us so the question is does satan tempt us in proportion to the level of faith so the scriptures that come to my mind, say right? First Peter chapter five verse eight and nine, also First Corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen. It's not talking. Uh, so First Peter chapter five verse eight and nine, it's talking about the devil as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And the Bible says, "You resist being firm in your faith." So I resist being firm in my faith, but it doesn't tell us, you know, how intense the temptation will be it doesn't say that um, in Ephesians chapter 6 when Paul is talking about the armor of God he says be strong in the Lord verse 10 be strong in the Lord in the power of his might then he says put on the full armor of God and then he says having done all to stand stand so that you may be to withstand in the evil day that means he's saying, you put your whole armor, there will be an evil day. That means there will be a time when the devil is coming with intensity. But if you have the armor, you'll be able to stand. But again, he doesn't tell us whether the intensity, the evil day, whether the intensity with which the devil comes is in proportion to our faith, or it doesn't connect that there. What the Bible does say, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, is... That God will not permit us to be tempted beyond what we are able to bear. But he will, in the midst of temptation, give us a way to escape so we can overcome. That's from God's side. That means God is saying, I will be with you and I'll make sure uh, you can overcome. Right? So to answer your question, The Bible doesn't state anything in relation to that in the sense that, okay, the devil will tempt you in proportion to your faith or something. But what we can think is the devil is going to try, tempt us in order to cause us to fail. Right? So he's obviously going to come with whatever he can, small or big or doesn't matter. He's going to come. His intent is, I want to cause this person to fail so that much we know and he can keep coming back with more temptations more craftiness more cunning um, but so so to answer your question we don't know exactly how he comes up with the strategies but whatever it is we have to be firm in our faith first Peter 5 9 Ephesians 6 
13, 14. If we have the armor of God, we can withstand in the evil day. That means no matter how intense it is, we will be able to withstand it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No matter what we're facing, God will help us to overcome. So that we can say based on the scriptures. It's okay. All right. Go ahead. Second question is, we have collective faith and we are praying for some subject. So if they're, they're not done and we don't get the result, it can discourage all the peoples. That is true. So like when I'm praying alone, so it can harm only me. Mm. But if we, if we are praying together, all we have faith. Uh, it is true. But then there are some things that we have to do collectively. Right? See, there are some battles which are personal battles. We fight alone. And then there are some battles that we have to fight as a community together, right? So that's why we have to come together and fight spiritually, I'm talking. And um, along that process, maybe sometimes we face setbacks, some failures. But that's where all of us have to know that God will cause us to triumph, right? So the question uh, when we last was, you know, when we have collective faith, we come together to pray for something together. If we fail, then so many people are discouraged. Whereas uh, if I pray alone, only one person is discouraged. So we are discussing that. Um, there are things that we have to do collectively. right? And even if we face a setback of failure, we must collectively encourage ourselves and go forward. Right? And this is where, as a leader, you need to know how to encourage the people. Uh, you know, a good example, I think, is in First Samuel chapter twenty-two. Uh, David and his and his army. He had a small army at that time. He was not king yet. Um, and uh, uh, he had an army of about four hundred people. They had left all their property, everything, family, all in a place called Ziklag. They'd gone away to fight somewhere else. But another enemy came, conquered that, took all their positions away, the people away. So when they came back, they saw everything destroyed. And they were all so discouraged. Right? They went to fight one battle, but another enemy came and took all these things away. And at that moment, it says that David's soldiers were angry with him. His own people were angry because they, like, you know, David, what happens? And But then it says, David encouraged himself in God. You know, so he encouraged himself in God. And then he prayed and said, God, what must we do? And God said, I want you to go and pursue. You will recover everything. So he told his people, those of you who want to come with me, come with me. We are going to go and pursue. And we will recover, you know. So some of them went and they recovered everything. You know? So that's when leadership is so important. When everybody is discouraged, the leader should encourage himself in God and bring encouragement to others and show that God will still lead us in victory. That's what David did. Yeah. Your question, Brian? Oh, God. Okay. Go ahead. In Matthew um, 26, where um, Jesus asks his um, three disciples to pray with him, mm. but they uh, they fell asleep. But um, I mean, why did Jesus need his disciples to pray for him? Mm. Okay. So, Ren's question is in Matthew 26. Jesus asked his disciples, specifically the three of them, Peter, James, and John, he said, I want you to pray with me. Then they fell asleep. So the question is, why did Jesus need his disciples to pray with him? Right? So there's something beautiful that we must understand. If you go with me to Romans chapter 15, in prayer, we actually strengthen one another. In Romans chapter 15, the apostle Paul is actually requesting for prayer from the believers at Rome. 
and in verse 30, Romans 15 verse 30 he says uh, Romans 15 verse 30 um, now I beg you brethren through the Lord Jesus Christ to the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me you strive together with me in prayer so when we pray together what is happening we are striving together so example if i am fighting an enemy by myself then it's only me against the enemy but if others are praying for me it's like example if three others are praying for me then it's like four of us are coming together to fight the enemy we are striving together through prayer right so that's what happens in the spiritual realm that is when we get people to pray with us for us in a given situation we are striving together or we are battling together through prayer this is a spiritual thing so it's through prayer we are striving together with this matter so remember that on the earth Though Jesus was deity, though he was God, when he walked on the earth, he limited himself to a man. So the people say, hey, why does God need help? Yeah. Uh, when he walked on the earth, he didn't walk in the powers of deity. He limited himself to a man. So as a man, he needed, you can think about this, even Jesus, who was the anointed one, he needed the striving together of his own disciples. Join with me now. This is a very crucial time. I have to say yes to the will of the Father and I have to go to the cross. This is the most important thing. This is why he came. So he says, pray with me. So Not convinced. <laughs> kind of. Uh, so if the disciples would have prayed, Will it have changed anything? So it would not it, see it would not have changed the will of the Father. The Father's will was for Jesus to go to the cross. That's the Father's will. Jesus already knew it. You know, in John 12, 24, 25, he says, For this purpose I came. I mean, I came for this purpose to die on the cross. Yeah. So he knew that's the will of the Father. That would not change. What would have happened was Jesus would have been even more uh, enabled and empowered to say yes to the will of the Father. So eventually he did it. Right? Even though the disciples went to sleep. He still said yes. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be. So he did. But how would the praying of the three disciples have helped him? It would have enabled him. It would have strengthened him to say yes. That was the difference. Okay. Um, any other questions, Prince? Yes, Prince. It, uh, it says like uh, in Bible, in Psalms, uh, David says like, help me to remember all my days were numbered. So is it like uh, our lifespan here on earth is already predestined how many years we will live? I'm sorry. Uh, is so, all, uh, so the Bible tells us all, all our days are numbered. So God knows the number of our days. So is it like uh, how many years we live on this earth is already predestined by god yeah so let's let's put it like this god's will is for us to live out the full course of our lives or we can know we know that from scripture example in uh, old testament exodus uh chapter 23 verses 25 and 26 he says 
the number of your days I will fulfill. That means I will help you live out the full course of your life. Then again in Psalm 91, 14, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. That means God is saying, I will give you long life. And like this are many other scriptures where long life, Proverbs 22, verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord, our riches, wealth, and a long life. Hmm? Proverbs 22, verse 4. So a long life is a promise that God has given to us. But I have my responsibility for every promise. See, every promise of God is conditional, whether conditions have been stated or not. Sorry, the question that, uh, that was asked here by Prince, I forgot to repeat the question, is... Um, the Bible tells us that the number of our, our days have been numbered. So Psalm 90 and also in Psalm 139, God knows the number of our days. Does that mean how many days we will live on earth is already predetermined? So that's the question. So what we are saying is God has promised long life to all of us. It's his promise. But every promise is conditional, whether conditions are stated or not. Every promise is conditional. So, for a long life, God is saying, I'll give you long life if there's a there are conditions. What are the conditions? Example, part of it would be, I need to take responsibility for my own health. So, a person cannot say, ah, oh, God will give me a long life, so I will be reckless with my health. That means they abuse their body, they do all the wrong things for their body. They don't take care of their body, then body will collapse. So, example, if God had, if the long life for this person was 80 years, but he didn't take care of it and he died when he was 30, it is wrong for us to say God planned only 30 years for him. No, God planned 80 years for him, but he uh, abused his body, he didn't take care of it, and he died at 30. Or example, if a believer is riding or driving his car very rashly, gets into an accident and he dies, can we say, oh, God only wanted him to live for 25 years? No. You know, God had promised a long life, but that is conditional. You have to live properly, take care of yourself, be careful, you know. And so if a believer is reckless and gets into an accident that costs his life, we can't say God only planned 25 years. No. Okay? So the word of God doesn't change. But every promise of God is conditional. Okay? Question? No Okay, any questions online students, you're welcome to ask as well. I'm just, uh, um, yeah, go ahead. In, uh, in one of the um, God's generous books that I read, um, like they were, um, one of the evangelists, they were having a healing ministry or they were having a service or something. And um, he felt, he he actually spoke to the people and told that um, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is not moving here because of one person's unbelief. So, I mean, and you said last time, right? If um, about the collective faith, like I asked you, and you said um, that if uh, the majority is in strong in faith, God will answer the prayer. Mm. And he still moved, you were told, right? God still moves even... Even if one person is an unbelief? Yeah. Mm. But in that situation, the Holy Spirit is not. How is that? Okay. So I'm trying to understand your question. So Ren's question is, um, so he heard an evangelist say uh, that... Um, there is someone here with unbelief. 
so the Holy Spirit is not moving, something like that. Uh, whereas um, last class, last week, I shared examples, many examples. And um, we were looking mainly at the ministry of Jesus, where um, even though there were people maybe in unbelief in some cases, um, like example, the man who brought his demon possessed son, or when they went to Jairus's house, uh, these were examples where it's possible that others were in unbelief, and yet miracles happened. And so what we concluded last week was the unbelief of one or more people is not going to prevent the person who is in faith from ministering to people. Okay. So having said that, and I still believe that, I, I believe that is true, but the other side is unbelief can prevent the person from receiving. So example, Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Jesus was in his own hometown of Nazareth. And the Bible says in both these scriptures, Matthew 15, 13, 52, Matthew 6, 5 and 6, that in his own hometown, Jesus could not do many mighty works except he healed a few sick people because of their unbelief. Okay. That means Jesus was anointed. He was in faith. But the people didn't receive any mighty miracles, except a few small things. A few, few, few sick people were healed. That means they didn't receive because of their unbelief. Right. So here it's about an individual receiving a miracle, but they were not they were not able to receive a miracle because of their own personal unbelief. Right. So it's not like their unbelief prevented Jesus from serving somebody else. It was their unbelief prevented them from receiving through Jesus. So perhaps. I'm relating that to this evangelist's case. Perhaps where the evangelist was ministering, if one or more people were in unbelief, even though he may be anointed, maybe, even though the presence of God may be there, the people in unbelief will not be able to receive for themselves. But it should not prevent others who are in that same place, who are in faith, from receiving. So in the same, same meeting, in the same environment, there will be people who are in faith who will receive. There may be people who are in unbelief who won't receive. And plus, you have to think about this, and this is true, that sometimes, in spite of the unbelief of people, God will still work miracles for them. Example, the man by the pool of Bethesda. He didn't have faith. He didn't even know who Jesus was. He got healed. The blind man whom Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He had no idea who, who Jesus was. People asked him, who healed you? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody came, put mud on my eyes, told me to go wash. I washed, I came, I got my sight. Then afterwards he found out it was Jesus. So before he didn't know. But, so God still moved sovereignly. Work miracles. So that's something we must keep in mind. Okay. All right. Any questions from online class? Okay. We're going to go forward to our next lesson. Uh, move forward. And I think, uh, you know, this week, next week, we will wind up the course. And uh, I will have to create some assessments for you to review the whole course. So. Let's do this. Now, the next part, I just want to, the remaining um, parts of uh, the course are just showing us some of the outcomes of walking by faith. One is, as this was lesson number 19, the joy, resilience, and rest of faith. So when we walk by faith, 
it's going to fill us or keep us in a place of joy. Okay, there's a joy to this journey of faith because faith is taking us out of the limitations of this natural realm. You know that you are not limited to just this natural realm. You are connected to God who is bigger, who is greater than the natural realm. So even in situations that may be looking difficult, in, um, in circumstances that look very difficult, sometimes contrary to everything you are expecting, even in those situations, you and I can have joy through faith because our faith is in God. Right? So look at some of these scriptures. Um, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So you're filled with joy and peace because you believe. Or through believing or in believing. Right? So, because of your belief in God or your faith in God, what's happening? You're filled with all joy and peace in believing. In First Peter one seven through nine, Peter says, "You know, uh, your faith, though it is tested by fire, it it is going to bring praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ comes." Verse eight, he says. You have not seen him, but you love him. And believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. That means your faith is being tested. You haven't seen Jesus yet, but you believe. And because you believe, you're filled with joy inexpressible that's beyond what you can you know even uh, communicate this is how, how much joy i have you're filled with joy even though your faith is being tested so they were going through trials they were going through difficult times persecution and so peter is saying see you are believing in jesus you haven't seen jesus but because you believe you have joy in your heart and even though your faith is being tested. So keep in mind, you can be joyful even through difficult situations when you have faith in God. Your faith in God puts you in a place of peace and joy. Puts you in that place, peace and joy. Number two, faith makes us resilient. Resilient means we don't quit. We don't give up. Even if we fall down, we get back up on our feet and we keep going. So resilient means you can't put me down. You can't take me out. I, come, I keep coming back. I keep getting up. I'm resilient. I never give up. I don't quit. So faith makes us resilient. People who are, who are not quitters keep fighting. We come back, fight again. Because we know our God cannot be defeated. Right? So we keep fighting. We stand strong. And faith also enables us to be in a place of rest. So that's very interesting because there may be turbulent things, turbulence all around us. But because we have faith in God, we can be calm. So we are in a place of peace. It's not saying there are no problems. No, there, are, there may be problems, challenges, trials, all those difficulties, hard, hard situations. And yet in the middle of all of that, you can be in a place of rest. That means calm. You're not stressed, you're not anxious, not worried, disturbed. No, you are in a place of rest, meaning calm. Isaiah 28, verse 16, he says, Alain Zion, a sure, sure stone, is referring to Jesus, and 
Notice what it says at the end of that verse. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Right? Or if you look at the uh, Barnes commentary, uh, it says, to make haste means to run away out of fear. Right? That means whoever believes is not acting out of fear. I mean, so if you, or if you put it in a positive way, if you believe, you are in a place of assurance, not fear, not anxiety, not anxious. You're not acting out of that hastily. That means out of fear, out of being scared. No, you believe, so you're in a place of calm assurance. You live like that. You operate from that place. Right. And there are other scriptures where God has promised. He said, in quietness and confidence will be your strength. So when in faith, when you're in a place of quiet, quietness and confidence, that is also a place of strength. Yeah, that is where we operate from. And uh, many other scriptures where God tells us, you know, be still. Be still. So faith enables us to be still. We, it, and it creates that knowing this battle belongs to God, God is fighting, and God will come through on my, my behalf. So, when we walk by faith, as people of faith, we can have joy, we can be resilient, and we can have peace or rest. Right? So, these are the you know, we could say the benefit of walking by faith in God. Which a person without faith in God may not be able to experience. You know, when things are bad, they're very anxious, very disturbed, they get a panic attacks, uh, they get all kinds of things. You know. But a person who's in faith walks in joy, walks in peace, uh, walks in quietness, calmness and is able to be resilient. You may fall down seven times, but you get back up again, because God will help us overcome. You know, that's what faith does in our lives. So that's how precious this faith is in God. So I'm going to pause here. We will uh, go for a break. Let me just see if there are any questions. Any questions from the online class? Everyone's fine here? Yes, Pastor. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. The others in class can hear you as well. All right. So let's go for a break. We'll uh, come back, and I think we have five minutes extra break today. So we'll come back in 15 minutes, and we will continue with our next lesson. All right? See you soon. Thank you.